Good morning, everybody. Welcome to episode three of Cobblestones Chronicles. I want to tell you today a bit about the wool shed because in uh, on this weekend coming on Saturday the third, we're having an event at Cobblestones called a Woolly Good Christmas. Sorry about the pun. And so today is a Woolly Good story. And I want to talk about our beautiful restored wool shed, which has had a bit of a checkered history, to say the least of it. It was um, originally built on the William Donald's farm in Masterton. And you might think, well, how come it's going, been moved to Cobblestones Museum in Greytown, which is an early settlers' village? And that's because we were offered, we were offered it in, on condition that we looked after it. And it's a beautiful wool shed. I'm, for those of you watching on TV, I'm about to show you a picture of it but um it's it's a, a very old it was built in around about um around about 1860 1870 something like that I'm not absolutely sure and it has um it's had a long history of use it was used on the big donald farm which was out, just outside masterton where the solway showgrounds is these days and it has we even have built a dunny right next to it and the next time you come to cobblestones make sure that you go and investigate the dunny all you need to do is just push the door and get a surprise. So inside the wool shed, we have the shearing place and we have a number of um, bits of shearing equipment, which is old, the old fashioned way they used to do it. And we also have blade shears. And um, on the 3rd of on Saturday, the 3rd of July, we're actually going to have a demonstration of blade shearing, which is fascinating to watch so it's hand shearing with the blades it's just amazing and it's so skilled we're very lucky to have somebody who's going to come and do that and we've got a few sheep we've also um in the wool shed we have a donald wool press so william donald who set up and built the he set up the farm and built the wool shed on his farm he was actually a qualified veterinarian and he left London in June 1842 with his wife Hannah, their seven-month-old daughter Marianne and a small flock of Romney sheep. His Romneys were the first sheep, Romney sheep to come to New Zealand and he had a shepherd to look after the stock. Um, when he during the long sea voyage, he befriended a chap called Barney Rhodes, who, when they arrived, leased two large runs in the Wairarapa, and he appointed William as his manager at Pencaro. So, in eighteen forty four, after negotiating with the local iwi, Donald. William Donald purchased a one square mile block from Rhodes and what seems to have been a lease to buy arrangement, we're not too sure about it, but it was situated on Judd's Road in Masterton. So while the um while William Donald built the wool shed, um the family's first home was built by the Tangata Fenua in the Rapu Bush House style. The Donald family, with those eight children, were made welcome and became an integral part of the community, with William serving as inspector of sheep for the wider Rapa. William was known for his leadership and very genial disposition. He was so well liked and respected as captain of the Wairarapa cavalry that when he retired due to ill health, this corpse disbanded. He died in 1885 and William's, William's children took over the farm. 
William's youngest child, called Donald Donald, who was born in 1854, assisted his father for some years and ran his own farms, but he found his calling as an inventor. And using his practical farming background as inspiration, he invented and developed practical items as solutions to the hardships the early settlers experienced in their day-to-day agricultural work. His most well-known invention was the Solway Press, now referred to as the Donald Wool Press. And the whole point of the Wool Press was to bundle up these amazing fleeces that had been shorn into much more compact size so they could be transported much more easily. And Donald and Sons got orders from across the country and indeed across the world, including Australia, South Africa and South America. In fact, everywhere where sheep were being shorn and they needed to compact the wool. Um, although we we think the wool shed was built about 1850, um, it might date from uh, just after 1870 because it does use mill-sawn timber. It's constructed of totara, which is very long-lasting, and the shed stood the test of time for more than a century. It had only ever been painted once. So part of the Donald land is now Masterton A and P Association for Showgrounds. And the sh- the association would l- wanted um, to move the wool shed off. It was a bit neglected. And in fact, it was going to be demolished to make room for housing. And tenders were called for destruction and removal. At least two letters opposing this destruction were written to the Wairarapa Times Age, questioning previous appraisals by the then New Zealand Historic Places Trust. They had said the building was apparently found wanting in those virtues which determine whether a building should be preserved. Perhaps we might know more precisely what has caused the sad end Bugs, building or bureaucracy. So an editorial stated on the same day that a young country has traditions and little enough reason to retain buildings which bar progress. But today the position is fast changing. So remember, this was 1957. Among a number of organisations and individuals, a sense of responsibility has grown to make sure that some of the tangible reminders of our past are preserved for future generations. And indeed, this might have been the seeds of the idea for Cobblestone's Early Settlers Village, where we have gathered together a number of old buildings from the 19th century. Um, The local branch of the Historic Places Trust launched an appeal for support and in 1960 the Masterton A&P Association decided to move the wool shed to its Solway showgrounds for use as a museum. It was going to be preserved for posterity. The move to the showgrounds was based on an agreement it would be well maintained. However, by 1966, the A&P Association had advised the local Historic Places Trust that the shed was now in poor condition. Undertakings for more um, serious preservation were needed. So, in 1970, the Greytown JCs resolved to accept the association's offer of the woolshed for cobblestones, subject, of course, to finance and council approval. So, it was transported from Solway to Greytown in 1974 at a cost of only $303. And again, it was moved in 1983 to a really suitable site within the museum grounds. 
Last year, in de- early December, we had the pleasure of having the wool shed renovations opened officially by the Governor General, Her Excellency Dame Patsy Reddy. It was a lovely day. We had so Kim Workman came along and blessed the restoration. And the contributions by many of the volunteers over the last three or four years to conserve and restore the wool shed to close to its original condition. The wooden shingles for the roof were replaced and they have to be replaced by every, every 25 years because every historic building in cobblestones has got a conservation plan, which means that we have to look after it seriously. So in a moment or two, I'm going to play a song um, about, um, it was closely related to to um, the wool shed because, of course, there would have been loads of dogs around in the wool shed in those days. And in fact, there still are. If you go to a wool shed these days, you'll see there's quite a few dogs. Robots have not quite taken over yet. So um, the... The song is a song by Peter Kate and it's called The Talking Dog and it's about the relationship that uh, uh, he's a cow cocky has with his dog and about listening to it. Here it is, Peter Cape and The Talking Dog. There's a young cow cocky and he's sitting on a log Sharpening his axe, talking to his dog Says to his dog, sick of batching all my life Dog answers back and says, why don't you get a wife? You got ducks in the duck pond, pork is in the pen No sooner finished milk and then you're starting off again So he hitches up his buggy and he goes down to the hall Lots of lovely crows, they're lined against the wall Says to his dog, mate, I'll leave the choice to you Dog picks out a good one and he says she'll do Oh, the duck's in the duck pond, pork is in the pen No sooner finished milk and then you're starting off again But you've got to get a license and you've got to get a ring Got to get the pass and get the choir to sing Great day coming down the church of three Who gives this woman and the dog says me And the duck's in the duck pond, pork is in the pen No sooner finished milk and then you're starting off again But this poor cow cock, he still hasn't got it right Dog talks in the daytime, missus talks at night Gonna leave them to it, get another lease Get up in the tea tree, get a bit of peace From the ducks in the duck pond, pork is in the pen No sooner finished milk and then you're starting off again Now if you want a moral and I don't know why you should Talking to your dog won't do you any good But if you must be talking, keep it sweet and nice Here's a tip from me, mate, don't take his advice Or the duck's in the duck pond, pork is in the pen No sooner finished milk and then you're starting off again Or the duck's in the duck pond, pork is in the pen No sooner finished milk and then you're starting off again That was Peter Cape's song, The Talking Dog. Isn't it delightful? So, um, a slight change of subject now. I just want to go back now to our to Cobblestone's stables because, of course, the stables were where the, um, the carriages that came over the hill stopped for the night. And they actually um, stopped there because... Often in um, places in Europe, 
and in America indeed, what would happen was the horses would be changed. So the stagecoach would, or the carriage would come rolling into the, the stables. The horses would be changed over to fresh horses while the passengers had some refreshments. And then they would... the carriage would or the stagecoach would carry on but in fact at cobblestones because there weren't it wasn't really a posting stop it was a important stop because the everything would stop there the horses would be resting and then they would either carry on up the coast towards even as far as Napier and Palmerston North or they would go back over the Rumataka Hill. So there was a, a, a large pub owned by Thomas Kempton and his wife, just opposite co- where Cobblestones now is. And everybody would disembark from the coach and get into the pub and have a meal and a, a bed for the night, I suppose. And then... Um, and then they would, the horses having been rested, would carry on the journey. But um, we have in cobblestones a number of carriages and it wouldn't be the same without our collection of carriages because we've got a butcher's cart, we have harness gear and tools and of course last time I was on this programme I talked about the Pride of the Valley but... um, I think the interesting thing to talk about is um, the there was um, the naming rights because, as we all know, naming rights are sometimes a touchy and sometimes legal issue. However, back in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, there was a more relaxed approach to the name of Hastwell's Wellington to Wairarapa Coach Service. At one time it was called Cobb and Company, owned by a Mr Forrester, and then Messrs Wallace and Thomas Ray ran a four co- horse coach driven by Mr Ray. However, Cobb and Co was the name of a larger Australian business and um, Hastwell had been absent in for a year in England and when he returned he was going to set up business again in opposition to the four horse coach which of course was quite fast. According to Gareth Winter of Wairarapa Archives, Hastwell won the mail contract again and bought out his competitor Mr Forrester. Unfortunately Mr Hastwell was was ill and he died in um he he died in oh i can't quite remember now but anyway he died not long after he set up the the service and the chap called james makara took over the coach service in the name of makara until 1888 so that's a little bit about the coaches and i just want to um remind everybody that we have we have a number of coaches at great at cobblestones and at the end of july on the 31st of july we're having a d- an open day where we're going to be celebrating early modes of transport and um I just heard this morning that Greg Lang, who's the mayor of Carterton and is also a wheelwright, is very kindly going to come and do a demonstration of wheelwriting on Saturday the 31st in the afternoon. So that's going to be really exciting because we we don't often have this opportunity. So as I said, opposite Cobblestones, there was a pub, a hostelry, which was very well known and very well regarded in the Wairarapa. And it was called the Rising Sun. And it was a proper pub. And I want to play you another song now, which talks of, because the Rising Sun, I believe, did eventually burn down. So this song is called The Day the Pub Burnt Down. Pull up a stump and lend an ear and story I'll relate 
About a sinful waste of beer I will elucidate I'll tell of how calamity struck Wapakiwi town And caused a gruesome tragedy the day the pub burned down We all had gathered in the bar upon that fateful day By horse and foot and motor car we all had made our way While listening to Manuka Jones, New Zealand's finest liar We heard a cry that chilled the bones The flaming pub's on fire! There'd been a drought for weeks and weeks The wells and tanks were dry No water flowed along the creeks We had no town supply The blazing sun without relent Turned all the green to brown Imagine our predicament the day the pub burned down Through smoke and flame we dragged the booze to safety out the door Then thought of what we stood to lose and rushed back in for more Stand by the fire brigade is here, those boys of high renown Oh firemen, firemen, save the beer and let the pub burn down They bashed the tops of barrels in while strong men knelt to pray They shoved their flippin' hoses in and shouted, Pumps away! They fought with beer and lemonade that raging fire to drown We fought and cursed the fire brigade the day the pub burned down Now more porks haunt the old pub site round Wapakiwi town And shickers roam the hills at night and hunt the firemen down They curse the cash they cannot spend, their raging thirst to drown Dry horrors drove them around the bend the day the pub burned down So that was a Peter Cape song sung by Mike Harding, The Day the Pub Burned Down. It must have been a very sad day. I can imagine the consternation that would have been going on. Well, that's almost the end of the programme for today. So I want to say thank you for listening or thank you for watching. If you want to know more about cobblestones, you can send an email to Cobblestones Museum Greytown and let me know what you want to do. My name is Jeanette Wallace-Gedge and I'm delighted to be here talking to you this morning. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.